parking lots back in Vegas. I need to do a bit of a recap in this vlog. Could be a little bit all over the place actually with this vlog, uh, both figuratively and physically. I was on the road for a little while. Brad and I, we drove up from Portland following the Poker Guys show there at Portland Meadows, about three hour drive up to the Seattle area. Special shout out to Mitch, showing us a little bit of uh, Pacific Northwestern hospitality. Took us up to the Columbia Tower Club, of which he's a member. This thing is on the 75th floor, overlooking all of Seattle. Gorgeous views up there. So thanks to Mitch for that, and also for driving us to the Fortune Poker Club, where I had myself a nice little session of plus $1,800. From there, the next day, we had ourselves a little meetup game. Two five, spread limit hold'em, $300 max bet at a nice little poker room called Redbird's Hideaway. As mentioned, this building, this uh, poker room here, this one's called Redbird's Hideaway, and it's recently been redone. Apparently there's like 50 people on the list here, so I am really digging the Seattle enthusiasm for a meetup game. Kind of funny, uh, we got so many uh, sort of surprise looks when we told people that that was gonna be the venue for our meetup game in Seattle. Um, apparently that place used to be a little bit divey. Good news though, it's under new ownership and it's been remodeled. Check it out guys, every table in Redbird's Hideaway is in use. Uh, I think we got six two five tables going. Pretty cool to see every table in use here. It's gonna be a fun night. Uh, bomb pots are happening, beers are flowing, so fun happening here in, uh, in Seattle at the Mug. Getting into the poker in this first hand, looking down at ace 10 suited. There's one limper and I make it $30 to go. Small blind in the limper call and the flop comes pretty favorable for us. It's ace 10 three with two hearts, so we flop top two. Small blind check calls $75, so heads up to a turn card, which is a seven of hearts, so it brings in the front door flush. He checks it to me and I just decided to check it back. I'm not too sure if I really love my check back there, but turn goes check, check, and the river is not the best card in the deck. It's the deuce of hearts, so now four hearts on board. He leads for $50, and uh, for that price, I think I'm just gonna have to pay it off, whatever it is, whatever it may be. $50 too cheap. Uh, so yeah, I toss in the $50, and he announces one pair. Two pair beats one pair uh, to this day. That rule has not changed. In this next hand, there's a straddle on, and I look down at pocket tens. Raise it up, get three callers. Flop comes queen, queen, three, rainbow. Seems like a pretty safe flop for the pocket tens and one that I think I want to see bet and deny any equity for overcards. So after checking to me, I bet $45 and everyone goes ahead and folds. So another, another victory in our book. This next hand is a pretty fun one in particular. There is an early position limper and we're looking down at jack 10 of hearts. Very pretty hand, gonna go ahead and raise it up. Try and isolate the limper to $25. The limper calls along with one other player. So three ways to another pretty favorable flop of nine, eight, three, all hearts. So flop ourselves jack high flush with the straight flush redraw. Checks to me and I bet $55. Player in the middle folds and the limper puts in a check raise, makes it 155 to go. Mildly concerned, but not really because he could for sure be raising worse here. Maybe he flops himself a set and uh, maybe he flops himself the worst flush. Obviously there's some better flushes out there and in sizing actually gives me a little bit of pause here, but there's not gonna be anything to do uh, that's gonna prevent me from putting in any more money at this point. So I just go ahead and flat call in this spot. The turn is a really bad card. It pairs the top card. So now obviously we're losing to top two that turn a boat as well as maybe like pocket threes, pocket eights. He doesn't stop betting, but it is a small uh, bet size compared to the size of the pot. He bets $100. So again, uh, having flopped ourselves a flush and with a small redraw available, not gonna do anything other than make the call here. So we are heads up to a river card, which is about as favorable as it gets for the Jack 10 of hearts here. It's the seven of hearts. Make ourselves a straight flush here on the river, the absolute nuts. My opponent, once again, thankfully puts in another bet. 
This time to the tune of $200, and he doesn't have too much more behind. He's only got like maybe $70 behind after this bet. So pretty straightforward all in, immediate all in. And uh, he gives it some pause because he seems to know that he is beat in this spot, but puts his last $70 in understandably, especially so when he shows, uh, he shows me the ace of hearts. So for sure a cooler at some point. Um, not sure if he actually flopped it there or if he rivered it. Seems like he very plausibly could have uh, flopped it as well. Found ourselves in a cooler situation one way or the other and uh, it's gonna come our way. River a straight flush. We get a little bit of a high hand bonus here. We add $150 on top of the pot. High hand bonuses at Redbird's Hideaway. Straight flush is gonna qualify for one of those. And uh, off to a very good start here at the meetup game in Seattle. So there is an interesting thing that goes along with this spread limit uh, rule here in Washington. So we are playing five to 300 as mentioned. And uh, another interesting facet that goes along with that is that you can only put in four bets per street, I believe. So if there's a raise and there's a three bet and then somebody four bets, no matter what the sizing is, the betting is capped at that point. So as an example, in this hand, and I'm at a new table now, which is exceptionally crazy, by the way. That's definitely worth mentioning. Lots of action here in the meetup game, as usual. And this table is the craziest table in the room. So when I look down at ace-king offsuit, make a standard raise to 20. Cutoff puts in a 3-bet to, I think, 60 or $65. And then the button puts in a 4-bet, and he makes it about $180. So there's no choice in this spot. I cannot put in another raise. The betting is capped. So I make the call, and the cutoff makes the call as well. Three ways, two of flop, which comes ace, jack, seven, rainbow. Pretty good flop for us, very dry flop. So we check it to the button who puts in a C-bet of, uh, I think $150. I'm not sure if there's too much point in raising here since the button isn't super deep and the board is pretty dry. So I just flat call here and the player in the middle, the cutoff, makes the call too. So pretty interesting hand developing here. And uh, the turn looks pretty safe to me. It's another seven. Check it to the button again who puts in the max bet of $300. Again, I don't think there's too much point in me doing anything other than calling here. So I flat call and the cutoff announces raise. So he can only make it an additional $300 since this is spread limit and uh, it's 600 to go. The button only has another $100 or so at this point. He calls all in for less and I'm not loving the situation actually at this uh, point because it's pretty tough to raise for value on such a dry board with worse in this spot. But considering how much action there is on this table and it's only a min raise, I go ahead and make the call. We are off to a river card, which I think is a total brick. And I check it over to the cutoff who puts in another max bet of $300. So I'm really not loving it at all, but it's almost like a limit game with this spread limit thing going on where at the pot size is giving me such great pot odds uh, with each subsequent street, each bet size that happens. So once again, uh, at this point, not loving it at all, but I go ahead and make the call and uh, sure enough, the cutoff shows us, I believe, 9-7 suited. So I think... I probably maybe could have gotten away from this hand uh, maybe on the turn when he puts in the raise on such a dry board. Uh, is he really going to raise it with no draws available with ace-queen? We lose to pocket jacks. We lose to ace-jack. And we beat basically no value hands. It's tough, though, because in these meetup games, there's just so much action to be found. And uh, especially the most action-heavy table in the room so yeah i don't know i think i could have gotten away on paper it's like a very sort of simple fold i think on the turn but it's very hard for me to sort of like describe the uh the table dynamics the game flow all that stuff all those intangibles and whatnot so that ends up being a pretty disastrous hand for me and uh erases all my profit on the night end up finishing the meetup game stuck about 700 dollars, i think including the high hand bonus that we got with a straight flush. It's always uh, so disappointing, you know, you make a straight flush and end up uh, 
loser on the night. But I say disappointing with a uh, an asterisk because such an awesome crowd that came out to uh, this meetup game. And uh, you know, it's really cool to go all the way up to the Pacific Northwest and there's so many uh, blog watchers and cool people that want to get together and just have a fun social night of poker. Pack the room. If you guys are in the Seattle area, if you live there or you're visiting, definitely want to consider Redbird's Hideaway for a uh, casual poker game. And a pretty nice setting, pretty cool setting, recently remodeled and uh, good dealers, friendly people all around. See, did you guys see that line, that registration line at the uh, the wind? Business is good at the wind, apparently. Uh, pretty sure we've been here before. I hope so, at least. Great spot here at the wind. A little bit of a hidden gem. Uh, this is the terrace bar. I think that's what it's called. Walk through registration out onto this terrace. Still very much in summertime here in Vegas, but lovely shaded area. Nice chill tunes and. Uh, all the soda water and lime you can possibly drink. Plan to go play a little bit after this, after we chat a little bit more. More recap to do. Following Seattle, back in Vegas for a couple days and then directly out to Austin, Texas. Tuesday, we're in Austin, Texas, and I've got my mug shirt on. Flew from Las Vegas this morning into Austin, Texas here for a 5-5 meetup game. There's already three 5-5 games running, actually maybe four, three or four, but it's about 6 p.m. right now and uh, it's still early. There's a lot of traffic outside and it's raining. Expecting a pretty good turnout here and expecting a pretty decent amount of action. There's no cap on the buy-in in these 5-5 games here at, here at the Texas Card House. And it's a pretty cool venue, currently sitting in this private room that they have on offer for rental, for private usage, private games. No rake taken off the tables, just a membership fee. There's a membership fee when you walk in the door, $10 an hour um, and no rake aside from that. So ends up equating to, I would think, somewhat similar of you know, the standard rake that comes off the table. Anyway, yeah, great looking venue. Lots of uh, refrigerators for you to bring your own beer into this establishment and enjoy it at your own leisure. Just a really nicely appointed room. Pool tables, in case you get bored of the poker itself. No, I don't know. Anyway, I'm not gonna badger on for too long about amenities and whatnot. We're here to play some cards. We're here to meet some people, have a couple beers with some friendly vlog watching folks. Let's play some poker hands, shall we? You might think that just because these poker rooms are independent poker rooms, they're not part of you know, a big corporation, a casino, something like that, you might think that the staff isn't on point, but these guys are all top notch. They're all fully trained and uh, WSOP ready to say the least. Oftentimes in, at the WSOP, you'll get less uh, experienced dealers than you will at these card rooms. Awesome hospitality again in uh, Austin, Texas. Unfortunately, where we started really hot at the meetup game in Seattle. Exactly the opposite happened in Austin. Good news is that we had, once again, six tables of 5-5 five five No Limit Hold'em running. This is proper No Limit Hold'em and no max buy-in in these games. If I mentioned that there was action in the meetup game in Seattle, this meetup game in Austin 
this was some proper action to be found. Lots of straddles going on, so the 5-5 is a little, a little bit misleading. These games are playing a lot bigger than the typical 5-5 game, so keep that in mind as we recap this session. First hand, straddle is on, as mentioned, and there's two limps with us looking down at ace-king off suit. I make it $60 to go and only the hijack calls. To make a long story short in this hand, the board runs out not in our favor and also in a, uh, a manner that can connect with a lot of hands. So I don't think C betting at any point in this hand is a good idea. At least that's the way I decided to play this hand in particular. Queen 10, 8, 9, 7. There's just so many hands that can continue uh, on this flop and on this run out. So we check it down and it turns out we're up against Jack 7 off suit uh, in the hijack. So my man did happen to have a straight there. That's not gonna work out for us. In this next hand, we're playing a bomb pot and we're looking down at eight, seven of clubs on a pretty good flop for us. Jack nine, eight with two clubs. So again, some straight flush potential plus a pair. There's another position bet for $100 and a call in between. So I don't think I wanna do anything other than make the call here. Even though we have equity against any hand, uh, we still have some decent equity against the flop straight. We're a dog in that situation. So I just decided to call, and uh, since we have position, we can see what develops on later streets. Turns a brick, it's an offsuit king. Doesn't change the nuts. The early position better puts out another bet on the street to the tune of $225 this time. The player in between folds, and I uh, still don't think I can do anything other than make the call here. Drawing live versus any hand, so Heads up to a river card, which once again comes a brick. The player in early position takes his time assembling a bet of about $450 and uh, all of that potential, that pretty looking flop does not materialize into anything. So I just go ahead and make the fold there. In this next hand, there's an under the gun raise to $20. There's three callers and we look down at pocket jacks in the small blind. And it's interesting because in some lineups in uh, Las Vegas games in particular, I'll probably just flat here just because the general standard of play tends to be a little bit more snug and an under the gun raise opening range tends to be pretty narrow and pretty tight. So I would hate to three bet here and then uh, face a four bet with pocket jacks, not exceptionally deep. But in this instance, with the amount of action that I'm seeing, I'm gonna go ahead and put in a three bet and I make it $140 to go. The big blind cold calls and the cutoff makes the call. Three ways to a flop, which does not come uh, what we had in mind. It comes ace high. I decided to check it next and checks all the way through. Turns not another great card. It's a king. I decided to check it again. And once again, action checks through. River comes a brick. And uh, once again, we all check it down. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe there's a chance I have the best hand here. I go ahead and show it. And we do beat the big line who had pocket tens, but unfortunately the cutoff in this instance had king queen off suit. Maybe we could have taken it down with a flop bet there, um, but I decided to check it and uh, turns out to be detrimental to us in this hand. So obviously not running too good here uh, in this meetup game thus far. Play another interesting hand on a double board bomb pot. $25 a person and again, I've showed you guys a double board bomb pot once at, from the Westgate at our meetup game there. I'm a fan of it, I dig it. And uh, on this double board bomb pot, we happen to flop a flush draw on both boards. We also have a gutter on the second one. So we're facing a bet from a uh, late position better. I haven't been running too good at this point, so my stack has dwindled down to somewhere in the neighborhood of $700, maybe 750 or 800 maximum. Just decided to go for maximum pressure and uh, just go ahead and jam all of my remaining stack in there, seven or 750 or something in that neighborhood into the middle. Everyone folds back to the better on this flop who goes ahead and makes the call. He actually flopped the nuts on the top board, nothing on the bottom, so, we end up bricking out on both boards with the flush draw, with the straight draw. However, we do make a pair on the second board and that's gonna be good enough to uh, win the second board. Since he does not improve on the second board, he ends up a queen high, so we're chopping this one, thankfully. And uh, unfortunately, that hand is actually going to be the majority <laughs> of our run good in this meetup game. And uh, I'm actually like trying to laugh it off a little bit, but. It ends up getting pretty brutal. We end up getting stacked a couple of times. The last one, there's a straddle on once again. I open up pocket tens, see a call in late position. The big line, I believe, big line or straddler, goes ahead and jams it in for somewhere around $500. I think I have somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,000 in my stack at this point. Just go ahead and rejam my stack in there, fold out the uh, late position collar. That is not what ends up happening. The late position caller ends up calling with pocket queens. We cannot improve and uh, 
That's going to put a uh, exclamation point on this meetup game for us to the tune of minus $3,000. Again, it's a little bit misleading. 5-5 five, five game. It's not exactly a 5-5 five, five game. There's a lot of straddling going on, a lot of action, no max buy-ins, and uh, a lot of money on the table at all times. And no rake. No rake in the games themselves. So that means stacks can uh, build pretty frequently and uh, pretty significantly. So lots of money on the table and a lot of action when all those factors combine to a lot of run bad and for sure some play bad, that's not gonna be a very good formula for success. Minus 3K in a meetup game. Not the result that you have in mind. Not the result that you have in mind when uh, putting together a, a fun social poker game. But once again, the silver lining is that we had such an awesome group of people come together and uh, hang out with us at this meetup game in Austin. Six tables of 5-5. Five, five. The numbers are for sure a high point in these, uh, these meetup games. Six tables running for you know five or six hours or something like that. I didn't quit this meetup game until somewhere in the neighborhood of three in the morning. It's a really cool silver lining. I don't want to downplay people coming together. I've said several times, best vlog watchers in the world on this channel. And uh, it always shows when you go to these meetup games, everyone is just so friendly and uh, excited to just have a, a fun night of cards. And I don't blame them if I'm just dusting off thousands of dollars. All right, I actually had to move inside just because it was ridiculously hot out there and I was sweating like a pig. I have been grinding here for the past two days in an effort to uh, get back to it, just get back into the grind. I've been playing the 2-5 game here at the Wins, $1,500 max. We have recouped about half of the losses so far from the Austin meetup game. Won $1,100 uh, two nights ago, won a few hundred dollars last night. So a little bit more to go, a little bit more work to do. I have a few more things to say about all this meetup game slash poker grinding and finding the balance and all that stuff. But for now, let's go put in some hands, let's get back to work. guys just a note or two just to wrap up this video it's already getting pretty long i actually considered chopping this video up into two or three different videos but just left them all one complete package see these little dots right here that's really annoying isn't it there's like one right here on my face not cool that's what's known as a hot pixel not cool canon not cool at all all right anyway this is actually like a couple of days later than the footage that you were just watching been on the edit grind for a good day and a half at least following that uh, session at the win session at the win went pretty smoothly for the most part uh it was actually kind of high variance we had some action players in the game i won about 600 a little over 600 dollars in the game it was actually up about a thousand at one point but gave a little back as i tend to do from time to time so so far so good in the effort to recover the lost funds at the meetup games on the road the last, uh, the last time that I can remember that we had one of these chats was in episode number two, I believe, when we booked our first loss on the vlog. All this time later, and I just kind of felt like having a uh, bit of a heart-to-heart -heart chat. Seems like we were due for another one of these on the balcony. So I mentioned I just wanted to touch on this concept of balance thing. And when I say balance, I don't mean balancing your bluffs with your value hands and all that poker stuff. What I mean is the broader concept of balance, the concept where you're balancing your work life with your life life. I used to believe pretty heavily, when I first moved to Vegas, I used to believe pretty heavily in this concept of balance. I used to think, you know, you maybe you work five days a week and then you go out really hard during the weekends and then you come back ready to go on Monday or whatever day. Obviously as a poker player, maybe you're taking Tuesday off, Wednesday off, grinding the rest of the week and the weekends. As time went on, I sort of personally realized that that was not going to cut it for myself. I know a lot of people believe in this concept of balance and I uh, believe that's how you go through life and you avoid burnout in that manner by doing things that really interest you outside of work and uh, then you can come back to your work life feeling refreshed and uh, ready to grind. I used to think that way when I first moved to Vegas and uh, it took me a 
approximately two years or so before I realized that that was not going to cut it for me. Um, I was never going to get out of the, the lowest stakes of 1-2 and 1-3 grinding by maintaining this sense of balance. For me, the only way to get out of those lowest stakes was to just grind consistently, nonstop, talk about poker with my friends nonstop, set up a text message group so that hands were going back and forth. Even while I was sleeping, literally, I could wake up and read 100 text messages about various hands that my friends had played. My reason for bringing this up is because I think it relates to this channel. And uh, the channel has sort of been the main focus for me during the past couple of years. Grinding has taken a bit of a backseat, um, and the results have shown, for sure, the growth of this channel has been awesome. Uh, obviously, it's not going to be uh, on the same level as a lot of mainstream YouTube channels, but as far as the poker industry goes, and a poker-centric, poker-themed YouTube channel, uh, definitely proud of almost 100,000 subscribers. Thrilled that all of you guys are watching these videos. Um, the success of that also shows in these meetup games when we get six tables of five five games running in a venue where they might get one maybe two games on a really good day i just think that's the way it tends to go with uh, whatever you are devoting the most energy to that's the thing where the most results are going to show as another example during the uh, world series this year i didn't really put out as nearly as many videos as uh, i did the previous year and even though the tournament results were less than spectacular the cash game results i was really happy with and i'm definitely certain that the reason for that is because i was very much focused on grinding and putting in a lot of hours sort of staying in the zone but uh just really being focused and less balanced less video creation more grinding and the results showed themselves in the cash game winnings even just the past few days of grinding over at the win it's been the same thing uh, i can just sort of when i don't have anywhere to be um, I can just play a session, I can just play my game, and uh, if I'm not worried about doing too much video capturing during those sessions, then uh, the results tend to be a little bit better, a little bit to a lot better for me. So where I'm going with all of this is that during the life of this YouTube channel, this whole thing, this production, as far as the videos themselves, it's been a one-man operation. Every single second of all the videos that have appeared on this channel have been edited by myself. And just about everything has been filmed by myself as well, minus some live cash game footage, things of that nature. I think the only way for me to create some sort of pseudo balance where I can continue to grow the channel, continue to crank out these videos while also devoting enough time to the things that I need to devote time to. Those things, including poker grinding, but also exercising, also spending time with my fiance. I think it's time to bring a little help on board. More info to come on that in the very near future. Watch this space. But uh, again, super thrilled that all you guys are here and uh, this community has grown to what it is today. Cheers for that as always. Sorry if this is a little bit cryptic. More news to come. Cheers, guys. And uh, sorry about these dots on my face and above and in the sky. Hot pixels, I guess. Three, jump.